Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Developing Dads podcast. I can't remember what episode we're on. It's got to be 60 something. We're, we're getting there, whatever it is. Um, this is this is an in-person one, so if you want to see our lovely faces on YouTube, there is a very glamorous right up the crotch shot on <laughs> <laughs> on, on YouTube on the sofa. I, do, I, I think... I remember, you know, setting up. I've done. I've filmed loads of podcasts professionally, so like setting up for people, getting them all done, making them look nice, and whatever else. And it's amazing how much it actually takes to set up a podcast. Yeah, you're at it for about a good ten, fifteen minutes. Yeah, because you've got to fiddle with the camera, make sure the settings are right, getting it all in the right place, getting all the bits and pieces. Whereas, like the online thing that we use in Riverside, it's just like you hit a button. <laughs> it's and pretty go. much, yeah, pretty much get and go. Um, whereas like other podcasts I've done, it's like three or four camera angles plus two different audio sources. You've got to monitor it all, make sure it's working. And then and then they turn around to you and go, is there anything else you could be doing while we're recording this? <laughs> <You're> like, well, <laughs> the priority is to make sure that the thing's actually recording, right? I think that's kind of the gist of it. Anyway, Neil's down in London. He is, um, he's been staying for a few days. And as is customary, we always try and uh, get a pod in because it's just a bit better in person, isn't it? Yeah. Although you were having second thoughts. <laughs> what having second thoughts? <laughs> I think I've just had a bad bad start to the day. I think everyone's just a bit grumpy. Like the, this is the second like negative podcast I think we're about to enter into. <laughs> I'm not negative, I'm fine. But we've just it's just cuz I think uh the car car situation is still kicking around and being a pain in my ass. And then Olivia's just kind of going through a period of uh separation anxiety. That's probably something we could talk about in the podcast how you deal with that or dealt with that over the years. But yeah, she's um, she's not a very happy bunny at all, a lot of the time. She was okay yesterday, but she kind of goes up and down. Yeah, well. this morning she's been a roller coaster. And I think, you know, when you're on the phone to the wife trying to organise car insurance for your brother-in-law's car so that we can have something to actually go car shopping and do all this kind of stuff, and then they're trying to charge you, like, the equivalent of two and a half grand a year <laughs> to insure two people on a Ford Fiesta um, because now you've claimed or something rubbish like that, and then your daughter's screaming at you because she wants to do all this kind of thing. It's all just a bit much, don't you think? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. <laughs> you can just sit in your dod. Um, so, yeah, anyway... Um, yeah, so we recorded a podcast this week already, so we, I don't know if we've got any updates from the week. Have you done anything catastrophic or enlightening? Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, so I flew down to London on Thursday, which was nice. Flew into City and then went out with a few work colleagues on Thursday night, which was good. Was this one of your boozy things again? Did you basically get hammered? No, I, I did 0% beers, which oh. is nice because the, the Friday I knew it was going to be a lot, a long day. It's like nine hours of sales training, lots of role playing, lots of acting out scenarios and stuff. So I didn't want to be hazy and hungover. Like my colleagues went out and they had five or six pints each, um, and they they weren't on, on form. Yeah, there's a bit of a, like a because even last night we we had three pints total, and I still woke up this morning a bit like oh yeah. a bit groggy. And if you're on a full day training course with that, it's just not nice. No, it's not. It's not good. And I think once you get past the age of about 29, hangovers are actually a real thing. <laughs> you know, because we, like when I was 20, what, 20 years old or something, even 18, working in uh, like a leisure club thing, I could go out till 3 or 4 in the morning and be up by 6 a.m. Yeah, go, on with go to work. I'd feel, feel rough, but I'd have drank a ton more than three pints, but I'd feel the same as I do now. Yeah. Yeah, there's that, that fog that hangs over you. Anyway, I had just nice your percent beers. Did the training course and then ended up over here on Friday night and we had a lovely 20-hour beef brisket that you cooked in the green egg. That was, yeah, that was kind of like partly an experiment, which you shouldn't really do for a dinner party, should you? You shouldn't really <laughs> experiment things because, um, yeah, the, the, for those that are not avid listeners and maybe we're into like listener num- listeners of three and a half or four and a half, who knows what we're up to right now. But we, um, yeah, I have a, a thing called a big green egg, which is like a giant ceramic barbecue. And you like it, Neil, don't you? Yeah. Would you have one if you could? Um, I think I think so. I don't know if I'd use it that much, though. I'd like to think I do, but the, the, the expense of it yeah, versus quite, how much I'd use it. It's quite punchy. Like, um, it was a very very kind gift, I must say. But um, I get a huge amount of pleasure from it. It's an amazing little thing. And, you know, when you, when you had the meat that you had on Friday night that I made, so basically it was a bone-in brisket, um, where you cook it 110 degrees for 19 hours, I had it in for, it's like up to 20. But you're kind of looking for a certain internal temperature and blah, blah, blah. But 
It was delicious. Yeah, and they only use salt and pepper, but the flavors through it were insane. It was still moist in the middle. You, should, you wouldn't get that in an oven, right? You wouldn't get that in like your conventional oven thing. No, no way. And it was absolutely delicious. Uh, yeah, so it's a, anyway, the big green egg is a big ceramic barbecue. It's like, it looks like an egg. And it's, yeah, you just put charcoal in it and then it kind of it can be an oven, it can be a pizza oven, it can be a grill. It's like an all round sort of thing. And it's very, very good. Like the food that you get off of it is incredible. I've cooked some amazing things like a few different uh, i've done some beef wellingtons on it i've done steaks i've done we've had rib roasts and things on it i've had chicken on it we've done fish so i guess i probably use it maybe once or twice a month certainly in the winter but in the summertime it's at least once a week yeah probably. barbecues stuff. and yeah it was fantastic so we had me you david my father-in-law and then aiden uh who's down for a course and we all just had a nice little dinner yeah we? mac and cheese mocks more and we did actually drink quite a lot yeah, I mean, I had six whiskeys on top of a few glasses of wine and a few pints. <laughs> yeah, I was quite surprised because so we had um, so we had some red wine. You had a, you bought a Cote de Rhone thing, which is quite nice, and then David bought a really nice Merlot. That was delicious. So we had yeah, two bottles between three of us. Two bottles between three of us, and then uh, Aidan was on the gin and tonics, and, uh, and then David was drinking some um, rum after that, and then whiskey, and then whiskey, and we had beer before that. And yeah, we got the whiskeys out. So Neil, Neil's only recently got into whiskeys. If you watch one of our podcasts, I think you you surprised me with that guy that sent you all that stuff. Yeah, from and, Instagram. And you started to get into the old whiskey thing. So I've got six or seven bottles, various different prices. So we were, um, yeah, we were pushing the boat out a little bit and drinking, <laughs> free pouring into glasses. Yeah, that no, was good. It was good. Um, and then yeah, Saturday we went into London and spent the day with Olivia and yourself, just but, hung around. Yeah, it was such a. It's be. I think one of my favourite times of the year is often wintry springy autumny kind of time where it's a bit cold outside but it's dry and blue skies and blue skies that's 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 got to be one of my favorite because you don't sweat really do you you don't you know, sweat your bollocks off like it's 30 40 <laughs> degrees in london sometimes and you can just walk around yeah yeah and that's sometimes that's a nice thing that i like to do with neil is we and because you can you can spend a lot of money in london you know you can go to like fancy restaurants and do some fancy things, but we just literally got the train to Farringdon, went up to coffee shop Proof Rock, yeah, which was nice. We didn't get a seat though, but we got a nice coffee there, and that's owned famously by James Hoffman. If anyone's into YouTube or coffee or anything like that, um, it's a delicious, delicious coffee place to go to. It's in Farringdon, very, very good. And then we just walked to the Tate Modern. We didn't really do much in the Tate though, did we? No, walked around. Yeah, fed fed Olivia lunch. <laughs> yes, sat and fed Olivia lunch, and that was nice though. It's um, the Tate Modern's good. Um, generally speaking, but I think I think it was just a bit much. It's just too many people kicking around. There's not really it's not really kiddie friendly. Yeah. It kind of is like the size of it is, but not. It's kind of a weird. Anyway, it's free. <laughs> that was probably the main reason why I want to go there. And it's also a nice walk from Farringdon to uh, past St Paul's and then on to Tate. And then we decided uh, where did we go from there? The new new change. We new went for change. lunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we went for Nando's, which was very good. Yeah. However, prices are going up, aren't they? Yeah. It's like 20 quid for a burger and a couple of sides. Yeah. And a drink. I remember going to Nando's and the two of you could eat for 30 quid, under 30 quid. Yeah. And the two of us for two main courses, a little side, like £3.60 for uh, Diet Cokes. Yeah. Like £3.60 for Diet Cokes. Anyway, it was extortionate, I thought. 50 quid, I think, for the two of us. I'd have thought right about that. Yeah. And then uh, we let Olivia walk around a bit and then we walked to Ozo and couldn't get a seat. So we went to Origin Coffee. Got a seat. Got a seat in Origin Coffee. Um, had a nice time there. I had to change Olivia on the floor because they didn't have any changing facilities, <laughs> which is often a funny <laughs> thing with dads. You must have experienced that sometimes is when you're in a bit of a pickle and you're trying to find somewhere to change them and there's no fa- no facilities. You yeah. You put them on the floor. It's so, yeah, it's mad to think in 2023 we've still got, and that was a massive bathroom that you could have easily fitted something on the wall. I had to, to change it on, but yeah, you just got to improvise. I've done it on jackets, and yeah. Do you do you? This is one thing I've always considered: is is it okay to change your daughter in public? So it's like if if we'd been there, right, and there was no change of facilities, but they say there's a bench at the back. <laughs> yeah, I don't could think I lay down a mat and no, then just change her? I don't think that's okay. Why? Just because it's like in people's faces. What? what if, you, if, if you're outside in a park, fair enough. But what if you've got no other option? Take her outside. She's like she's 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 <laughs> let loose in her nappy, like properly. Isla's gone for, to town. Yeah, that's one even, of those. That's even worse though. Yeah, what you, do still, you, you still don't do that in public. What do you do though? <laughs> Take her outside. 
So you take it out to the street and do it. Yeah. You would you would not do it. <laughs> you would not do it in a safe, clean environment. You'd or, rather go out in the street. Or I'd look for like a Marks and Spencer's or a, some kind of John Lewis or a shop. But bear in mind, we were in uh, like a cool, hip district in Shoreditch. So you would have uh, you would have not still not changed her there. No. Wow. I just, sometimes I just think you just got to put up with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I was kind of against um, when I saw um, boys like three plus years old peeing in public, like at the side of a tree in the park. I also that was a bit weird. But I let my kids do that now. <laughs> <laughs> People, like, why, like, how do you, you? There's no. There's no feasible way of controlling that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Like, if if Ben and Lewis come up to you and go, "Dad, I need a wee." And you're a good fifteen minute walk. You ain't do you, you. You're doing it wherever it's possible. Yeah, yeah. So that's just a, a fact of life now. Where yeah. they need to go. They need to go. Yeah, and it's kind of like so. That's kind of my thought process is if it's if it's a bit of an emergency or there's literally no change of facilities in in the vicinity of somewhere. Yeah, but imagine if you were sitting having a nice coffee, reading a book, and some guy beside you just changes his daughter. It's stinking. You just accept it. Well, yeah. What, what else? What other choices have you got? Because <laughs> it's like I think I think the one thing I'd see there is that the parents not not some like hooligan who just thinks that it's okay to change a pooey nappy in front of everybody. I feel like in that situation in particular, if there was no change of facilities nearby, what like they've they've thought about it. Yeah. They, haven't, they haven't just gone. You know what? Screw everyone else. I'm going to change this, this crappy <laughs> nappy um, in front of everybody. Yeah. Fair. But I don't know, I suppose it's situation to situation. And it's not like anyone can really complain, can they? No. They're not going to come You're to you. You're not going to get arrested. No, you can be like, excuse me, you can't change your daughter here? Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Try and stop me. So we had a bit of that. And then we, just, we were just walking. A walk day yesterday. We did 15 odd, 16 odd thousand steps. Lovely day. Um, lovely weather. Just kind of wandering around. Yeah. It's, I quite like those kind of days, if I'm honest. And we ended up in a, in a pub in an evening called the Pembroke. Wow, yes. I forgot Which... we did that. <laughs> that's I've now remember I now remember it it's kind of the area I live in it's really nice it's in Surrey and it's really nice it's quiet like we did a little walk this morning went around and you, you'd agree that it's nice and quiet yeah pretty pretty good all around but then they've just got this weird like they don't have any especially in the area I'm in they don't have any nice little pubs do they no so a nice Not walking distance anyway. no n- nice little kind of Surrey kind of little pub they've only got this kind of like weather spoonsy type of one just down the road and what did the review say that you looked up? It was like three <laughs> months ago. Yeah, give it one star. And apparently there was a fight in the in the pub. Glasses were thrown, chairs and tables were thrown, and for some reason the the bouncers or security guards locked everybody in the pub. And um, and this reviewer was fearing for their life. And then the the bar st- or the bar manager or whatever replied to this review publicly and said, "Sorry, we'll do a full investigation." <laughs> yeah, we take we take your your opinions and your yeah, your like, thoughts to to consideration. Some automated thing, but yeah, just uh, and then we're, we're sitting down, maybe halfway through into our pint. This um this young lady came over with a tray of shots. She was basically basically asking tables, "Do you want a, sh- a Jaeger bomb for two pounds fifty? And I haven't seen that since I was like eighteen. Yeah, in clubs. I mean, it's it's kind of like a, a captive audience, right? There's two guys <laughs> sat drinking, you know, a couple of pints. I, I'm not entirely sure that they're really the yeah uh, the right audience for no. <laughs> wanting to I mean, Jaeger bombs. She was speaking to old guys and girls as well. Everybody, regardless of what they were doing, yeah. what they were drinking, where they were, she was like, "Do you want a Jaeger bomb for two pound fifty? I might. I, I could. It would have been quite funny if it was in the middle of the day. And the sort of families of, of kids and, and <laughs> parents, and they're like, "Would you like a shot of uh, Jaeger bomb for two pound fifty? Apple sewers, yeah." yeah. Apple. So that that that's a bit. It was a bit of a weird pub, and it's just kind of, yeah, it's just one of those kind of pubs. You're just a bit like, I don't really know, like what what goes on in here. Yeah, and like where people come from, because it's quite an affluent area. It's a nice area, I'd say so, but it's just it just it's just a bit weird, and uh, I didn't really know what to do. But Neil wanted to go. Neil was like, "Do you want to go to Pembroke? It's a ten minute walk." I was like, "You sure?" He was like, "Yeah." Let's do it. <laughs> I didn't get stabbed or locked in. No, we didn't get stabbed, locked in, or glasses thrown at us. <laughs> but um, I'm sure if we stayed there long enough, something would have happened. Then we had a bit of an early night, and today was nice. Went for a walk. Yeah, enjoyed the sunshine and um, the frosty morning. Yeah. Do Do you like this? Do you, you know, you have you ever considered moving to London? No. Why? Just too too far away from friends, family. You don't have any friends. <laughs> Yeah, I quite like my 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 Scottish. Have you ever thought about moving, like moving into another country? No. Oh, why not? 
I like. I always thought like maybe before I met Rebecca and before I had kids, like America was on the cards. I applied for Camp America. Did you? Yeah. Did an interview. Didn't get it. Oh, you didn't get it. <laughs> no. What? What was the feedback? <laughs> I didn't get any. Um, but I remember meeting the guy in a, a coffee shop in Dundee. Um, as my kind of first first interview to chat to him about it, and yeah, he got no feedback. Got nothing. Did they re- did they re- did he reply to you and say you didn't get it? Or? Yeah, oh, but okay. it was an automated thing. Oh really? That's um, a bit rude. Yeah. So I, I guess life would have been completely different if they said, "Yeah, come out for three months and do this Camp America thing." Um, but yeah, not anymore. I'm pretty settled where I am. Oh, I know. I, I think, yeah, I think it would be quite an upheaval. I mean, one of uh, David was talking about this on Friday. One of his old school friends, so he's in his 50s, got a couple of kids, got a wife. They're moving to Chicago. Wow. So, yeah, up, sold up, sold the house, and they're, yeah, shipping <laughs> themselves off to Chicago. Yeah. So, would you do that? Like, if, if let's say that um, Shark Tower goes global. And they're like, hey, we need you to move to yeah, Chicago. It'd have to be a big opportunity. It'd have to be like a, you get a package. and the- Yeah, let's say it's a few quid more. You know, would you would you ship the whole family over to Chicago? Yeah, I think so. Oh, wow. Okay, like, so, so you would move there. It'd, just have, it'd have to be a certain Financial thing. gain. Um, Rebecca's cousin's husband, he works in oil, and he's getting a transfer to Australia, to Melbourne. Um, he's got two kids, and they're all moving out there Wow. in April. Wow. What what would be the figure? How much would you have to get paid to move to? Yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be the kind of the salary. It'd be like more of a package of, I don't know. You get fifty grand towards your house, or I don't know. I don't know what kind of number it'd be, but it'd be help to relocate. Wow, well, would you go to Australia? Is there is there a limit? Like, would you go? Would you move to China? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I think America, Australia, perhaps. Yeah. Great chat. <laughs> <laughs> we're going off piste here. Is it, what's the piece? We don't, we're just doing some random dad chat thing. Anyway, again. how's how's your week been? How's my week been? What's the latest with the car? Uh, what's the latest with the car? I don't like. I can't imagine any of this is for like legal reasons or anything like that. So I'm pretty sure it's open to discussion. They didn't tell me I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> but basically, yeah, we're at the stage of valuation of the car, so that's kind of like a a process, I guess. And Neil, Neil, to his surprise, thought you just had to accept the first offer. But I've refused the first offer and they're coming back with another one. <laughs> so you, you have to do some, like, it's like just some dancing around crap, isn't it? You know, there's, why isn't there like a, an independent body that evaluates your car and then that's the price that they'll give you? Like, why, why do you have to, why is, it, why is it a negotiation? Yeah. Like, at what point, like, why, why if they phone me up and say it's worth this much, I can turn around and say, no, it's not. I've got evidence that suggests it's worth it. Like, why haven't they done the due diligence properly? That seems that seems like that seems a bit kind of off. Yeah. Anyway, I've got lots of thoughts about insurance companies right now, and I'm not very happy about them. <laughs> I guess they're just trying to make 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 money, aren't they? But that's the thing. Like, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. Like, that's not that. That should be in, like, especially when it comes to the value of something. Because if I'm allowed to turn around to someone and say, "Nah, mate, it's not worth that much," then how does that work? Yeah, I Cause, agree. Because they're allowed to turn around to me and tell me how much my insurance is. And I can't turn around and go, no, my insurance is worth this much. <laughs> like, what? doesn't matter. Anyway, anyway, so they, they, they asked me to send some evidence of what I thought it was worth. And I'm kind of punching for a couple of grand more than they were offering me. So we'll wait and see. I think one one interesting part is the fact that our car is worth nearly the same as what I paid for it. I've added 30,000 miles onto it, which yeah. goes to show the crazy used car market, you know, to think that I've been I've had a car for four years. And it's not even depreciated in value, even though I've, I've used it more, which is bonkers. But either way, that, that's not too bad. So we have to go through that process. It seems to be taking a while to get back to me. So we're just waiting to see what the second offer for uh, for the car is. Um, and then today, I think I hinted at it earlier on the, on the when I was talking about how my, my trials and tribulations of trying to work out this to do a pod today was um, getting insurance. So my brother-in-law has been very kind to offer to let, borrow his car for for a month or so. And that means, you know, we've got to get insurance for it for a month. And bear in mind, for a Ford Fiesta that I had previously, I was about 350 quid a year for insurance. You know, I've got five years, no claims. Uh, been driving for six or seven years or something. Got Laura on it. She's been driving for like 13 years. Like all that kind of stuff, right? Park it off the drive. Lots of things. Well, to get two people and one month's worth of car insurance, £209. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> For mad. one month. 
Like an equivalent of two and a half grand. Are you mad? I, I hope that's not your new premiums. This, that, I will go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will go mental. <laughs> Be like being back at a 17-year-old 17, 17 pastor test. Yeah, I know. It's like, this is, this is like, it's just never ending really. But I'm, I'm slightly now, slightly now concerned that they're going to try and charge me like two or three grand a year to insure a car. Which, like, beg his belief, considering the fact that I like I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Like I've I didn't drive into anyone. I didn't cause an accident. You didn't drink drive. I didn't drink yeah. drive. I didn't I didn't do anything. But I had to claim because someone else stole my car. Like yeah. I don't uh, that, so we'll wait and see. Like I'm I'm steal, stealing worry from the future, which I don't really want to do. But I suspect it's not going to be fun. Um so then we'll hopefully get that car. Maybe I think Laura's gonna pick it up today after she's finished. And then um that's pretty much my week, really. Saw you, cooked dinner, drank drank quite a bit on Friday, went out all day Saturday, and then today just been hanging out and chilling. Really. Yeah, planning the week ahead. I've got my um, got my little agency video editing thing up and running, so that's that's good to go. I've got another person to hire. She's passed, so I need to m- email her and get her on board. So I've got two people signed up, a couple of people onto packages for decent editing and management, and so so yeah. Like an all right week, I guess. Just just this car situation, which yeah, it's um, the worst time of year as well. In January, everyone's feeling a bit yeah. I know. End of January, like I just don't want. But then, to be fair, my house gets painted on Tuesday, <laughs> so that's another thing to pay for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so house gets painted on Tuesday as well. So then next week, next week I've got a couple of shoots as well. So I'm quite busy. Oh, we've got a, we've got a crying Olivia. We're, what we're trying to do is actually squeeze in a pod just before. While Olivia has a nap. And before I go to the airport. And before Neil goes to the airport. So we shall see how this is going to go because she just she's piped up a wee bit. So she hopefully hopefully goes back to sleep shortly. <laughs> Don't have to edit this podcast. Um, anything anything this week in the news you want to talk about, Neil? Uh, no, but I thought you had a quite interesting topic on like clinginess and oh, a grumpy toddler. Very true. So we're currently going through the process of kind of Olivia having like this separation anxiety. And apparently that's a very normal thing to happen um, for children anywhere between the age of about six months, I think, and three years. So what will happen is she'll wake up like in the middle of the night and just scream for mum, yeah, like her, she's doing right her, now. I heard her this morning, this morning at half four in the morning. Yeah, so she, and she stands up and it's all like it's very, very dramatic, um, which is understandable. Like she's obviously suffering and doesn't want to, is kind of worried about mum. And mum not being there and that kind of thing. So we're trying to navigate that because if, even if I go in, she's not interested, not keen, like yeah. doesn't want to talk to me, just wants mum um, or nana. So she'll just and you try and do like the sleep training thing. I don't know if you did that. I'm sure I've got some questions. The sleep training thing where you're like, let's not go in. Let's just let her try and figure out to settle herself. But it's like the most intense cry that you can possibly imagine, uh, as if they're being, you know. Murdered. Yes. Yeah. And it's quite, it's quite terrifying, actually. Do you? Do yeah. The whole, the whole kind of sleep thing. Everyone's got their own technique. Everyone's read different books, different blog posts. We, um, we took the the European or Scandinavian route, where the all three kids co slept with Rebecca until they're about eighteen months. The twins are about twenty four months, and um, yeah, it, it, in our bed or when the twins were there, it was. Rebecca and the twins and I slept in the spare room and like we just got through it and now they sleep like angels from half seven till half six with no terrors, no coming through, nothing like that. So um, we we did read about the kind of the leaving them to cry for 10 minutes, going to see them, leaving them to cry for 15 minutes, going to see them and that kind of thing, but it didn't appeal to us. So yeah, we did the whole co-sleeping thing, which is very, very popular in the Scandi kind of Norway areas. Yeah, I just don't, I just don't want that. Yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't couldn't do it. Like it, it, you got to be both on board with it, and you've also got to have limits. So going past maybe two years old, I wouldn't recommend it because they're just going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. But when they get the confidence to go in their own bed, like the, the boys and Isla, that we had no issues really after we kind of made that decision of like, right, you, you you're confident enough now, you can sleep through through the night, you're going into your own bed. Yeah, there was no issues putting them in their own bed. 
Just just so people know, if they're listening on the pod, uh, Olivia has gone back to sleep. <laughs> she's, I've not just left her screaming there. She, usually, if you just leave her for a bit, she's, she's all right. But certainly in the middle of the night, she'll start screaming. And then also we have things like, um, like this morning when Laura needs to go and do a, like have a shower or something. Like Olivia was freaking out. Just going mental. And she does that. She she doesn't like we're quite good we've we've as you do is you read stuff, right? You try and figure out how to do it. But it's pretty basic of telling them what you're doing, where you're going, yeah. how long you're gonna be there for. And normally they're all right. And also like today, even when uh Laura left for she's off to go and see some friends for some breakfast and breakfast brunchy kind of thing. She was fine. Like she didn't kick off, she knows she's gone, she's got me. Um so it's kind of it's a bit weird. It kind of comes and goes as well. Like it, I think it gets worse when she's a bit ill. So sometimes she's a bit fluey or a bit tired or whatever else. The whole sort of thing gets a bit overwhelming. But we're kind of working on it. No, I don't know. I don't know what we can do. It's just you got to ride it out, right? Yeah, I think they kind of go go through leaps. Um, one of the things that I kind of mastered was the art of distraction. So if some if Rebecca did leave the room or. There were, you could kind of sense they were going down that kind of spiral of tantrums, then like look out the window or yes. just there. Oh, is that a rabbit? Oh, is that a dog? <laughs> is that an airplane? Yeah. Oh my word. Yeah, um, very, it's very easy to do that, isn't it? Yeah, and like yeah, just get them to snap out of it and change the change the kind of the environment quickly. Yeah, the the toys, uh, books to yeah, standing on like there's a thing that we do now. We stand at the window and she looks out to the window. And I, I can look at my window now. It's absolutely disgusting. It's covered in sticky fingers, <laughs> but it it really distracts her for a good part, good five minutes, and then she just forgets about what's happened. Yeah, yeah, and then you move on with the day. Did but. you did you ever have to resort to Peter Rabbit or Teletubbies or yeah, there was TV de- stuff? Definitely, definitely TV stuff, and I mean. The boys now in Isla, they're, they're old enough now. They don't really tantrum, or if they do tantrum, they generally snap out of themselves. But there's no, yeah, the kind of sem- separation anxiety and the weird moods have kind of gone, thankfully. The weird moods. But I think I, I, was, I was mentioning it to you earlier where, like, Olivia can't speak. She says a few different words, but she can't express her feelings like adults can, Ben and Lewis can, Isla can. So the only way she knows how to is either to laugh and smile or to cry and shout. Yeah. And yeah. you just got to got to ride with it. So thankfully, Ben and Lewis can tell me what's wrong, and I can either argue with them because they're not getting it, or we can reason. Yeah, but I'm I'm also I'm also slightly terrified when you get down the route of them developing their own opinions and thoughts on certain <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. right now, obviously, we're going through the process of argue, like not an argument, but she's she's tired. She wants mum, and she's you know having a bit of a tantrum about something. But I'm um. I'm very aware that that then develops into being a 16 year old and thinking that it's okay to go out till you know one o'clock in the morning, yeah. drinking in the park. Yeah. So, have you thought about that <sighs> situation? I think it comes down to trust and putting like boundaries. So, I don't know. An example might be Isla knows that she's going to bed at eight o'clock. So when it gets to eight o'clock, she goes to bed. Like just and making those boundaries aware and sticking to them. I think if there's if there's too much flexibility and there's too much, I think it comes into routine as well. If there's too much, yeah, flexibility and there's no routine, then that's going to impact them as well. But keeping things, keep, keeping people, uh, yeah, I don't have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> Are you just making stuff up on the podcast? I'm just saying words. So is, is that what you're doing? But no, routine's a big thing. Yeah, routine routines made a massive difference. Um, well, it makes a big difference for Olivia. Like we know, I think it makes a good big difference for us because we just know would expect when she can't communicate with us because she's now she talks a little bit now like we can understand like if she wants something or if she, she'll point and take us somewhere or do something we, she can communicate in some some vein but when it's non-verbal communication like being tired or wanting to play or go to the park or watch something or do something then she'll kind of almost like direct you to it or we know that it's it not sorry i don't know what i'm saying what I'm saying is the non-verbal stuff is that when she's tired, you know she's going to be tired because it's 11 o'clock and that's her nap time. Yeah. Because yeah, it's yeah. a routine. I know that she's going to be hungry because it's when she gets up from her nap, she's going to be hungry because it's lunchtime. Yeah. And her dinner time is four or five o'clock. Like all these kind of things all slot into place. So, yeah. There was this weird show on Channel 4, this was years ago, I think pre, pre before I had kids, or maybe Isla was, was younger. And it was looking at families who have no rules and the kids get to do what they want. 
And like the the kids were di- different ages of like primary school up to secondary school and stuff. But if if he wanted to cut his hair and shave it off, he could cut his hair and shave it off. He ate when he wanted, ate what he wanted, and it was just an absolute chaos. I just yeah, I, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting just like do a study and see kids that have routine and a well structured kind of day to day life versus kids where there's no rules and they get to do what they want. Like in twenty years time, what what type of human being are they going to be like? I'd be curious about what kind of cave person they'd be. <laughs> yeah. Because if, if you, you know, what an adult, I guess, an adult that, that during that period in human existence, I guess rules would have just been like, don't do, don't go over there because you're dead. Yeah. Lion will come and get you. <laughs> yeah. Like you're dead. So it, to me, it, you know, thinking, thinking about it, it, the rules apply because a lot of the time it's safe. You know, like if these kids don't have any rules and they're like, oh yeah, you can just go run around, do whatever you like. But there's a road outside and there's cars and danger. And there's also dangerous people out there. Not, yeah. not that they exist all over the place, but you can't just go and talk to anyone. You can't just go and hold anyone's hand. You can't just go and do anything. Yeah, And not because someone's being difficult. It's just because it's safe. Like you don't want, you don't want to, like, oh, I don't want to wear my seatbelt. I don't want to sit in my car seat. Well, there's rules against that because it's it's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, and people can die. Yeah, so, I think it's important to offer some some choices, but control those choices. So, but there's, certain, there's a certain point where there's there is no choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like just as adults, we don't have a choice on certain things. Yeah. Whereas other things we do because of the safety aspect. You know, ultimately we've got to protect ourselves or be protected. So yeah, I don't I don't know how I don't know how families would be able to operate where there there's literally no rules. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I mean, yeah. As I say, it'd be interesting to see what they're what they're like as adults. Because you have rules at work, right? Yeah, rules are everywhere. You commute to work, your your weekend, going to a shopping mall. There's rules you need to follow. There's laws. It's not even laws, but you've got work stuff, right? It's like Neil. Neil's like, oh, I just want to start at one o'clock in the afternoon. Is that going to be all right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not going to be all right, is it? Because <laughs> that, that was a similar. There's a similar thing with um, whole extra holidays. So so. Um, I think a friend of mine works for a large corporation, organization, right? And they have unlimited holidays. Same as us. Yeah. But what they found is people took less holidays. Yeah. And there's now, now a stigma. You take holidays. So before I'd get like 30 days a year, I could use them how I wanted. But now I get unlimited. I feel guilty because I don't want to be taking the piss. Yeah. So, yeah, it's weird. But the, the do make, so we still got to book the minimum, which is 25 days. Mim- minimum. Yeah. Um, by law, you got to take like twenty five days a year in the UK. Um, so yeah, they they track that, but then anything over twenty five days, they don't track. So why don't you just take more? Why don't you take fifty days? Because I've got I've got a boss. Like okay, I feel guilty. Why do you feel guilty? Because yeah, I don't want to take the piss. But why would you? How are you taking the piss? It's unlimited. <laughs> you can take a hundred days if you want. Yeah, that's what Rebecca says. <laughs> well, it is. Like but, what? Why don't you try it though? Like this is the, this is the thing. Like you know, it's if it's unlimited holidays. And let's say you've tracked it up to say twenty four days. Like, why why don't you take an extra two weeks off? Like, do they have limits in terms of how long you can take off? Anything over two weeks has got to get approval, right? So take two weeks off. Take three two week stretches off. That's forty two days, like <laughs> with weekends. <laughs> yeah, but, that, but that's it. Like the the that's that's a like maybe a, not necessarily an example, but if you don't have a rule, then people don't know where they where they exist. Like yeah. where, where do they sit? Like what's what's unacceptable, what's acceptable? Because most people operate within being told what to do, not necessarily dictating it for, for themselves. Yeah. And like the whole routine thing is kind of has, has rules around it, but um, humans love routine. So when we want to lose weight or we want to go to the gym, if you build a routine around it, build a habit around it, you're generally going to be more successful than if you had no boundaries or if you had no routine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I mean... I'm trying to think of like a weight loss study that, that did that kind of thing where there was kind of, you know, restrictions. But generally speaking, the more restricted someone is, the better result in terms of weight loss. So they're like, you can only eat 500 calories a day. That's it. Then they'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So the rules, the rules thing is kind of interesting. I, I don't know. I don't. And that's the thing with like the co-sleeping stuff. I just don't. It feels like it's, they're then encroaching on our sort of space and our time and what we want to do. Whereas they, they've got to, they've got to understand that they're kind of got their own space and their own thing. And eighteen months of like a kid sleeping in my bed, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, be a bit too because you didn't sleep. Then you didn't sleep with um, 
in the same room as Rebecca and the boys. You had your own room. Yeah. I mean, twins were a, like, I think to say you wouldn't co-sleep with twins is, is you can't say that without having twins because going up and down every half an hour when they each waking each other up, feeding them, blah, blah. But you have to, you have to co-sleep in a sense that they'll be in a cot next to the bed for at least six months. Yeah. Yeah. But outside of that, it was like not nah, get her no room. Yeah, we we were different with the especially with the boys. They slept in Rebecca's bed. God. For two years. Yeah. Nightmare. Did she not worry about like rolling over and suffocating them? No. So there's like there's safety. So we got a, a firm mattress, a very firm mattress. And you get a certain kind of bedding and like limit the pillows and there's like thing but like as I say, Norway and Sweden and stuff, that's what they recommend. Like that's just yeah, what they do. Amsterdam as well. There's also other things that they recommend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like but is there not something like that they're the most content or some kind of, they've got the best quality of life? It sounds like you're confirming your bias. Yeah. Because you, you feel like sleeping, co-sleeping is the right way to do it. Yeah. Okay. And it's been all right for us. I, I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> what I'm saying is that I, I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, it's fine. Um, just because it's like, yeah, the safety aspect of things, the independence. Again, again, you could probably say that will kids turn out a certain way if they do a certain thing? So if they don't have rules, will what kind of adult will they be? If they co-sleep for two hour, two two years, what kind of adult will they be? You know, I, I guess you could all you could say all those things as well. Yeah, and it's like yeah, breastfed for two years versus six months and all that kind of stuff. Just guessing. Yeah, we're all just guessing. So whether or not Amsterdam does it or not, then I couldn't care less. It's like, yeah, I mean they've legalized weed, <laughs> and and they've got a red light district as yeah. well. So yeah, that, that's like the whole parenting thing, it, and it's the same with this kind of like whole attachment issue thing that goes on. It's like how you deal with it. I don't know. You just kind of guess, don't you? Like, yeah. You can read all you can read all the books and the bloody blogs and you know. Pull up whatever. Because I was talking... Actually, this is a good point. I was talking to a friend on Friday that I met for a coffee. And he was like, oh, you know, did you read up on it all, becoming a dad and whatever else? And I was like, nah, didn't read any books. <laughs> yeah. There's not... Yeah, I, I didn't either. I have read this um It's called The Brain Child. No idea what the author is. But it's all about like how the brain develops over the, the course of a baby, toddler, kid, and then into teenage. And that was really interesting. Like... He takes apart each part of the brain and how it works and the the yeah process it goes through. But in terms of learning, I think the biggest thing that I would recommend is as long as you and the wife or you and your partner are on the same page, who cares what your friend says or what your in-laws say or what your parents say, as long as you both agree to a certain way of doing things, then I think that's one of the most important things. You're going to yeah. get stories from everybody. You get gr- yeah. Grandparents, everything's going to have their own technique, but... Yeah, yeah, I I just, because I remember when he said to me, he was like, oh, did you read the books? And he was like, well, how did you learn? I was like, well, I've managed to dress myself this morning and come to coffee. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure if a baby's crying, I can pick it up and yeah. work out, you know, are you hungry? You're not hungry? Because like, the needs of a needs of a small baby, they're not very complicated. No. Like, no. do they smell like they pooped themselves? No. Do they need an nappy change because they've wet themselves? No. Have they eaten in the past two hours? No. Oh, might be that then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or and if you if you if you dissect all those and you're like, oh, maybe she just wants a cuddle. Process of elimination. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's a game. So <laughs> so then it's like and then it's the nuanced stuff of like, you know, co sleeping versus like do you let them cl- cry? Do you like what do you, how long do you breastfeed for? It's like none of these things really matter. Like you literally can just do whatever you want. And they'll probably turn out they'll turn out how they turn out. Yeah. Like uh, uh, Olivia could be really into hardcore rock music and just want to go touring until she's 65 yeah or she wants to become an accountant and drive a volvo and how she slept for her first two years isn't going to make a difference <laughs> well i mean i guess i guess some things like we we're talking about yesterday about fail like we're sitting having a pint and talking about like motivation and failure and all that kind of stuff but i do feel like though there's probably one consistent thing is if you if you're a supportive parent and you're there, and they recognise you as as someone that they can basically lean on for help in any way. I think there's, I think there's, there's probably I'd, I'd go as far to say there's probably more likely of success of some kind. Yeah, and and whatever success is defined as, but they're more likely to, you know, not 
not they're more likely probably to take risks or, or or perceived risks of like going for a certain job or going to do a certain thing if ultimately their parents are probably still together that have had an education that have a house you know yeah yeah now i think yeah the whole kind of the way our kids brought up and the values and stuff and having a, that mom and dad together aspect i think that's a big big impact if you if you have parents that have been divorced at a young age and you kind of go between house and house and like meet different partners and yeah that kid's gonna be i think have a troubled life just complicated yeah confused i don't i don't think well confused i don't know but complicated certainly which you know we've we've all of our families i think your wife my wife our parents are all still together um but yeah i'd be curious about the differences ultimately of people that or kids that grow up in terms of what they're doing. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, when they're growing up, doing all those kind of things, like how they behave and what they're up to. Um, because, it, yeah, I just feel like it'd be... I think that if there's one thing that probably most parents could do is just give them a loving and supportive uh, backup, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Oh, that's good. We're agreeing on something then. <laughs> not not co-sleeping. No, no. I'm, I'm past that. All right. Is there anything else I need to be aware of before we um, before we move into toddler three plus? The, is there anything that you came across? It was a bit mad. Just the the three teenagers they get called the what three teenagers. So it's when they're three oh. and they act like teenagers. Do they? <laughs> was this was this the one when you had that thing where was it Ben wanted to drive the car? It was Lewis. Yeah. Is that a three teenager thing? Yeah. Right. And they just they just want the control and. They will do anything to get that control. So the thing that Gordon's talking about is I was shopping with Lewis and he was desperate to sit in my seat and drive the car as we were trying to pack the shopping into the car and stuff. And he had a massive, massive meltdown because he couldn't drive the car. That's a three-nager type thing. Right. Or even like if they wanted, I don't know, a certain suite or like something, they'd just lose their oh. SHIT, but in a lot more of a dramatic way than what, what Olivia's doing just now. I can't wait. <laughs> So what, what process is that? Do you just let them calm down or do you have to tell them that illegally they're not allowed to actually drive a car until they're 17? Yeah, I mean, like, there is, I guess, stages to it. And then the stage where maybe they, they go too far, like, shouting and just, you know, you're sitting in the seat, full stop, and that's it. Be firm. Right, so you're setting the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Because in that family you're talking about, they'd have let the kid drive the car. <laughs> yeah, imagine what that what happened there. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's also a case of like explaining to them why, and especially we, I think Rebecca and I are both good at this. When in the moment, there's no point of explaining because they're just so fired up. But when they've calmed down or when they've realised they've had a nap or something, and half an hour, an hour later, bring it up again and say like, Lewis, the reason you couldn't drive that car is because it's illegal." And you don't know how to drive the car. So, like, revisiting it, not in the moment, because there's no reasoning with a teenager. But, um, yeah, as long as you kind of go back to it, and this is why Daddy got angry, this is why Daddy got mad, is because you kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on wanting to drive this car, and you couldn't drive it. Can't wait. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a bit much sometimes. Like, when she's when she's in a bad mood, it kind of, it really, it really can be quite a challenging day. mm Dra- um, just draining. It's very draining because you just can't. You've got so many. You've got so many other responsibilities and tasks as a as a fully grown adult. But and you can't win. You just can't win. No, and you just don't know what to do and how to do it. And you just got to try and you just get through the day, really. Yeah. So I think from three to four, you get that kind of three major where they're pushing every boundary they can, but they're also quite independent. So setting up a park, they can go and do their thing. Um, and then four onwards, I think it's a really sweet age where. They've kind of learned the boundaries and understand the kind of hierarchy of a family. So, like me, mum, and then what is the you kids. Then, then mom. <laughs> um, and yeah, like the, the boys will be going to school in August. So, yeah, they're they're definitely getting better behaved and understand the the boundaries and what not to push, which is nice. Yeah, I f- I feel like I feel like the parenting thing kind of goes in this like wave format where. You have the excitement of coming up to getting born. Then they're born. You get like the the crazy, amazing thing that that is. And then it kind of comes down a bit because you're like, holy crap, this is hard. Yeah. Like you're six months deep and Laura's, Laura's still breastfeeding. They're still co-sleeping. You're having to sleep in another bed. 
like you're not sleeping very much both of you like the whole thing is just all very new and then as olivia's got older and she gets closer to like walking and then she starts walking and then she starts more independent like she can you know drink a bottle by herself and do these kind of bits and pieces you're like oh this is unbelievable and I feel like there's a little bit of a crest we're coming down into again, <laughs> where we've got this kind of like separation anxiety stuff. It's all a bit kind of much for her. You, you, you find it difficult to understand like what she wants, what she doesn't want. She's trying to communicate it and it's all kind of a bit toing and froing. Um, so I feel like there's a little bit of a, uh, that we're coming down the other side of that hump. But then you're talking about this bit where you get into past that section and you get into the bit where they're like, you could just sit with like a nice coffee. Oh, and they'll, yeah, and soft play. They'll go and do their own thing, and they'll come and tell you all the stories about what they've been up to, and, and yeah. then some kid that's tried to punch them, and they've actually they've overcome it, and then <laughs> hooked them right in the jaw. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I look forward to that. Um, I am desperate for a wee. So <laughs> is, that, is that the ending, Gordon? Well, I'm gonna have to. Cause I'm bussing. <laughs> and I've, you know, like I've, what I find as well is now because Olivia's the way she is. You've kind of got your eye in the back of your head. Yeah, you so, can't concentrate. Yeah, yeah, it's because I'm now trying to listen out for her crying at the same time as focusing on having a new conversation with you. Whereas you're sat here just enjoying yourself on yeah. a podcast. And I, I've got a, a nice trip to the airport that I can listen to a podcast, read a book, get a coffee. Look at you, Mr. Luxury. <laughs> then back to reality tomorrow. And I've got to work out how much a bloody car insurance is going to cost for a Ford Focus <laughs> shortly. It's probably going to be 14 grand or something stupid. Yeah. That's that's scary. Yeah, and I've got my mortgage going up in May, and just we can hear all about the the car insurance. Can I just get off this adult and train and just go back to <laughs> eighteen year old Gordon? Yeah, just getting drunk at the weekend and no hangovers. <laughs> anyway, thanks thanks very much for listening to the Do Up and Dad's podcast. I hope it's been a another not depressing <laughs> trials and tribulations of adulting and uh, podcasting. I hope you've enjoyed the YouTube angle. That we've used. I just couldn't be bothered doing anything else. I was going to do cue cameras, but no, I can't. Be <laughs> but here we are. You can you can see you can see us on beautiful YouTube if you want to watch us. Neil Neil said he was going to post on on Instagram with reels a lot more, but he's uh, he still failed to do so. Posted three in the last three weeks. Yeah, over the course of six months, three. <laughs> so you can follow us on there, Developing Dads. Also, like I said, YouTube. We've got Developing Dads on there. By all means, check us out. We're on all podcasty stuff. If you're listening to this, you'll be listening to it on a podcast, I'm sure. Um, if, uh, why you would listen to it other than Spotify, I don't know. Maybe Apple Podcasts. Outside of that, who the hell? What the hell are you listening on? Um, yeah. Any comments? Any questions? Please let us know. Um, it's been very nice to hear from various people dropping me random WhatsApp messages, Facebook messages, uh, Instagram messages, saying they listen to the podcast, which is kind of weird, but kind of nice. Yeah, I've been time. getting them as well more recently, which, which, is, which is very crazy. nice. So we do appreciate it. Um, either way, thanks very much. Have a good week and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Goodbye.